Sean, sure, welcome to Waterstones. Thank you. Um, I'm holding this gorgeous tome. I'm going to call it a tome because it has some, some weight and heft to it. This is Speeches of Note, the latest in your Of Note series. Um, and this collects together rhetoric, I guess. It collects together speeches from the past, from very recent history, some delivered, some not delivered. There are some amazing stories in here. What, where did this project start? Was there a particular speech that made you think, that's what I should do next? Yeah, well, this, so my first book was Letters of Note, which is a, very similar to this, but letters. And there was a, there's a, a memo in that book um, which details a speech that was to be read by Nixon should Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin not come back from the moon. Mm. And that was the first speech I saw that made me think there was room for a book like this. Um, that, you know, that there have been plenty of collections of speeches published before. But I just think there's a gap in the market for something like this. This isn't speeches that change the world or, you know, it's maybe it's speeches that change someone's life or speeches that were never made. I love looking at speeches that were never made because it shows you, you know, an alternative timeline. Mm -hmm. um, it's also filled with facsimiles and photographs of the speeches being made. So I just wanted to make a beautiful coffee table book of speeches that haven't necessarily been celebrated before through no fault of their own. One of my favourites, of course, is the one that the speech that helped actually to save somebody's life uh, by not quite stopping the bullet, but certainly stopping the bullet killing somebody. Can you tell us more about that? That's my favourite speech in the whole book, and it's not necessarily because of the content of the speech itself, although at the start of it he does mention what's happened. So it, it, this was Roosevelt. He was trying to get re-elected for a third, a third time, I think mm. it was. I should know this. Um, and he was making speeches all over the land, uh, a few a day, and he came out of his hotel one afternoon to go and make another speech, and he had this like nine-page speech in one of his pockets folded up, so it was incredibly thick. In his, um, in his top pocket, and as he walked out of the hotel, he was shot, and the speech was so thick that it slowed down the bullet enough for it to not hit his vital organs. And the sp that bullet stayed in his chest for the rest of his life, and he refused to go to hospital until after he'd made the speech. <laughs> so he went to the, he, there's, there's a photo of the speech in question with the bullet hole, and um, he stood up there with a bloodstone stained shirt and said, um, I don't know if you've realised, but um, I've just been shot. <laughs> so it's something to the effect of, it's going to take more than a bullet to, to stop me making this speech, and then went off to make this amazing campaign speech yeah. that, that went on for like... It's 10, a very long speech, It's isn't a long it? speech, yeah. yeah. He delivered didn't just by stand a man with a bullet in his chest. Incredible. I mean, yeah. that is just an extraordinary story, extraordinary image, and I think that, mm. as you say, you've got the image of the speech in the book, but it conjures up for the reader. You can see a man stood there with the bloodstained shirt, yeah. <laughs> refusing to, to sort of sit Which is down. what I wanted to do with the book. It, these are like windows into moments in history, and I'm trying to put people in these people's shoes as much as possible. So mm. to find an image of that speech itself, it really does kind of take you back and adds another dimension to the, to the, to the book, really. Uh, this is probably a bit like asking you to, to choose your favourite child, but I just wondered whether through the collation of all of these speeches, whether there was one particular favourite that you had or one that, that you're so glad you discovered? Um, aside from that Roosevelt one, which really is an incredible thing, there's a Nick Cave. In fact, Nick, this, is, I've, this isn't orchestrated, but in every book I've done, I've had something of Nick Caves in it. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> um, but there's a speech of Nick Caves in there, which he made. Um, he made it twice, actually, but the second version is in this book. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful speech he makes about the love song. Um, and it's quite dark in places, and he plays some songs throughout the speech, and it's just a, a really interesting um, take on him from the, about his craft, mm. uh, which I adore. There's a speech from Kermit the Frog. Um, yes. Um, which he made, it's like a, a graduation speech he made in America. Um, I love that one just because it's so silly, but actually quite, um, quite a useful thing to read. Um, yeah, there's so many. It is like choosing my favourite child. Yeah, his bit is, is a very yeah. mean question. I won't make you answer it any <laughs> There's further. also one from Picasso, actually, which I, I don't think has ever been reprinted before. And he was in Sheffield at the time, and it was, um, uh, he made a beautiful speech, a very small speech about um, the dove, mm. about his famous painting of the dove. And that was the first time that dove was ever used as the, as the peace symbol for the, for the organisation. Yeah. So I was really proud and pleased to get that one in there. Um, and there's a huge variety of speeches in here, as I say, it goes back hundreds of years in some cases. And it made me think about how we're now very used to seeing speeches being disseminated through social media, through YouTube, because there'll be somebody there with a smartphone filming mm. stuff. But it made me wonder how speeches were shared 100 or 200 years ago, because presumably if you were there, you might remember it. 
Um, but it, was it to do with them being published? I mean, how did you find some of these speeches? Um, they had to be published. I mean, it was a, lot, a lot of it was down to word of mouth. Mm. If you go back to people like Socrates, you, you're relying on word of mouth. There's, there's a speech in there. Oh, God, I've forgotten which speech it is. But there's, um, oh, it's Sojourner Truth. He was a, um, um, a freed slave. And she made this incredible speech, this ex extemporaneous speech. But there's, there's real debate about which version of her speech is true because it wasn't actually recorded. So mm. there's like three separate accounts of this speech. But they're, they're all amazing and you get, you get the message through it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you're counting on people's accuracy as reporters, I suppose, yeah. which back in the day, it's, it's hard to know. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? There is something about the, the, the thought that goes into oratory, which is slightly different to, I think, other forms of communication. Would you agree? Definitely. It takes huge confidence. Although saying that, there are some speeches that are, are made quite uncomfortably. Um, is that even a word? Unconfidently? <laughs> it <laughs> without, is a word now. Without confidence, yeah. uh, which is still incredible. But d I've, I've made speeches before, you know, um, um, kind of talking about these books I've made, and it's absolutely terrifying. Um, and this is on quite a small stage to, to <laughs> imagine someone walking out in front of thousands of people like yeah. Emma Gonzalez, who... Yeah recently made that speech in front of hundreds of thousands of people and stayed silent for three minutes on stage, which I can't imagine the, the, the kind of the confidence it takes, the strength it takes to do that kind of mm. thing. Um, so yeah, it, it definitely gives them more weight. I found often that after f finishing one, I wanted to take a little moment just to kind of take it in, you know, to sort of let it settle because there's, there's often lots to unpack with what people have said in their speeches. There is. It takes time to absorb some of them. Yeah. And it's a bit of an emo emotional roller coaster. No, it really is. I say, which very, is what I've tried to make it, yeah. And I think especially if you, by adding the, the images throughout the book, it just adds that extra dimension in some cases mm. to, 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 to connect to that moment in history. Mm. Sean, it's a, it's a beautiful book um, and there is so much in there. So thank you so much for, for collecting them and uh, for telling us a little bit more about them. Thank you.